Hello and welcome to the 2016 Year in Review. In this video, I am going to talk about the games I played in the year 2016 AD, discuss the quality of them, what I thought about them, and then give, at the end, my personal game of the year. First up is Pony Island, a game I played early on in the year, but it absolutely left a great impression. Pony Island is a phenomenal game in a very abstract sense. The actual gameplay isn't actually the highest quality. However, it's it's a game that gets into your head. It's a game that you really do just... It, you gotta give it a try. It's kind of a movie game. It's about two hours long. It costs like five dollars. So it's kind of just, you know, sit down. You enjoy the game for a few hours. You can play it over and over. There is a lot of secrets hidden within it. But the main playthrough takes like two hours. But it's such a memorable experience for so many reasons I don't want to ruin that I would recommend just dropping the $5 or however much it is. It's a cheap game, sitting down for a few hours and giving it a shot because it's a really, really enjoyable experience, especially if you're really into video games. It really messes with your head in some very, very cool ways, and it's overall fantastic. Next up is Bravely Second End Layer. Now, Bravely uh, First, or it's actually Bravely Default, but the first game in this series was my game of the year whenever it came out, I think two years ago, something like that. And it's a, it's a fantastic sequel. It really does improve on the original in so many ways, phenomenally. It doesn't do anything, you know, absolutely out there, but the original game was really close, in my opinion, to being like nearly the perfect JRPG. It really was that good. And this game only does it better. The story is more interesting, in my opinion, because the characters in the first game were a little dull. They were really one-dimensional for the most part, and the main story was actually somewhat dull up until the climax, really. But in this game, the main story throughout is really interesting, and the side stories are very interesting because it's reusing all the characters who already have a bit of a personality. They're given a lot more depth here and a lot more interesting interactions, and the game overall, from a story perspective, is a lot better. And from a gameplay perspective, it's a lot better. It actually solves some common problems of the genre, which was not something I expected from what is a somewhat sort of standardish JRPG. The biggest thing it solves is grinding, which is interesting because, and this is just something I want to focus on for a second, but in most JRPGs, if you're losing in a fight, you go grind. It's kind of just the way the genre works. In this game, they actually made grinding interesting because if you win a fight in only one turn, you can do a second fight that gives you bonus experience. So you have incentive to actually figure out sort of almost in a puzzle sense how to, in a puzzle sense, how to defeat random encounters in one turn and then chain it. Because if you beat it in one turn and then a second random encounter shows up with a bonus experience and then you beat it in one turn again, you get a bigger bonus. And random encounters become more interesting than just mashing A. You actually have to think about it. Even though they die quickly because they're just random encounters, they're not, you know, the super tough bosses which are phenomenal, just like in the first game. You actually fight a random encounter, you figure out how to beat it in one turn, and manage to have enough resources to beat another one in one turn, and etc., etc. And grinding actually becomes sort of fun. You do a few of those fights, maybe four or five, you get a level, you go fight the boss again, you've gained a little bit of new strategy, maybe, and you beat the boss, and it's super fun and awesome. Bravely Second is awesome. The new jobs are amazing. The old jobs do get to return, which is amazing. It's phenomenal, and I love it. Next up is Fire Emblem Fates. Now, Fire Emblem Fates is actually three games, but it's also one game. It's a bit weird. If you don't know, the game was released with two different parts, both of which cost $40. However, if you purchase one, you can go and purchase the second half for $20, and then there's also a third half, which is only sold digitally for $20. It's a bit of a weird business model, but it's actually very fair. Essentially, if you want the whole story, it's $80. Now, that is a bit more expensive than the average game. However, in this game, Fire Emblem Fates, all three games, it isn't like a Pokemon thing where there's five different fucking monsters and you pay $40 for them. That's not Fire Emblem Fates. Fire Emblem Fates is actually pretty much three separate games which are in the same universe and with some of the same characters. It is not a silly thing like Pokemon where there's a few different monsters. It's actually pretty much three different games and they all use the same engine and a lot of the same characters and stuff, but it is pretty much three different stories and tons of different levels for each of those stories, tons of different maps to do your strategy on. And if you don't know, besides that little spiel about the pricing, um, I personally finished the Birthright story 
and got most of the way through the Conquest story and never purchased Revelation. So this is my opinion based on that, and I just wanted to kind of get that out of the way because it's kind of a weird thing with this game. However, Fire Emblem Fates is really good. It's a phenomenal game. The gameplay is amazing. It is a strategy RPG, a square tile-based strategy RPG. It is really good. The characters are really nice. The art's really nice. The music is wonderful. It's a really good game. I don't really have that many complaints, to be honest with you. Uh, if you're planning on getting it, if you are interested in a strategy RPG, the three different versions, there's a lot of interesting things. The Birthright version of the game is what would be the sort of easy mode, and the Conquest is what would be the sort of hard mode. And uh, the Revelations one is kind of just in the middle there. However, they are all different stories. The basic premise of the story is you're a kid who was abducted at some point early on by the neighboring kingdom and raised there, and then at some point you go to the original kingdom, and there's essentially a choice early on in the game after about four levels, basically after a tutorial type thing. You get told, do you want to go with the kingdom you were raised in? Do you want to go with the kingdom you are rightfully to? Or do you want to just go make your own and screw everyone? And those are where the three different branches come from. And overall, the story is really good, the characters are enjoyable, and the gameplay is absolutely phenomenal for strategy RPGs. This is a phenomenal strategy RPG gameplay-wise, and overall it's just a really, really good game for the 3DS. I would recommend it a lot. Next up is Tokyo Mirage Sessions uh, Sharp FE. Uh, it is a JRPG that I, I didn't play. I don't know why it's on the list. Um, oh, yeah, it's because I own it, but I never actually played it or put it in my video game console. So, uh, you know, I heard it was a good game. I heard it was a fun JRPG with a, you know, cool sort of uh, Tokyo Pop kind of aesthetic and s soundtrack kind of thing going on. But uh, I didn't play it, so... Shit. Next up is Dragon Quest VII. This game is technically like 15 years old, but this, I played the remake on 3DS, and uh, it was a very fun time. It's, you know, sort of a Dragon Quest-y game. I really like Dragon Quest. I like JRPGs a lot, even though they're really long, and I usually don't finish them, because, you know, even if I play it for 30 hours, it's halfway done, and then a new game comes out, it's really vicious if it's another JRPG, because then I just never finish anything. Man. Anyway, Dragon Quest VII is a really good game, though. I'd recommend it if you enjoy JRPGs. Next up is Pokemon Sun, another sort of JRPG, and Pokemon Sun, I mean, it's probably the best Pokemon game in the main series ever, but, you know, if you never liked Pokemon in the first place, you probably aren't gonna like this one, and if you liked Pokemon in the first place, you've probably already played this, so I really don't even know what to say. If you are interested in Pokemon, and you've never tried a Pokemon game, I think this is a great way to start. Pokemon is a very well-designed, very fun game. It is a bit on the easy side, because, you know, it's for the kids. However, in more recent games, they've been doing a lot better at giving players the option to make it more difficult in simple ways. Personally, this game is really, really good for me, because I personally hated a few of the mechanics in Pokemon games, and this one kind of solved all of them, really. It got rid of HMs, which were dumb, and nobody liked those. And now you just have these cool ride Pokemon that you can bust out whenever you need to do what previously would be an HM. And if you don't know, HMs were basically moves you used to interact with the overworld. However, you had to use your move slots on your Pokemon to do it, and the moves were always really bad, and you didn't actually want to use them on your Pokemon, so it was just annoying and not fun and really dumb. But now, not only is it a more interesting animation, it's more fun, it's more exciting, it's just better in every single way. I love so many things about this game. It really is sort of a definitive Pokemon experience, in my opinion. There's still problems, uh, they still haven't solved somehow. Online connectivity is really weird and not intuitive at all. I don't know how they keep messing that up. You'd think that somebody, at, not even just Game Freak, but at Nintendo, would have figured out what the internet was at this point, but they haven't. But Pokemon Sun and Moon is a really fun game. I love the new creature designs, I love the new music and style, it's very enjoyable, and I would highly recommend it if you enjoy Pokemon or you're interested in Pokemon. Next up is Pokken Tournament, a Pokemon-themed fighting game that mixes a 3D fighting game and a 2D fighting game. Personally, I found this game to be really fun. Uh, the biggest problem I had with it was none of my friends really thought it was as fun as I did. 
so didn't really have anyone to play it with. The single player mode is just kind of fighting dudes, it's not super exciting. It does have an interesting little RPG element to it where your fighter, or your Pokemon, in this case, gains a little bit of stats after a certain amount of rounds, but it's not super exciting or interesting. There is a lot of customization though, you can make your little trainer waifu as adorable as possible. That's fun. Uh, my waifu is way prettier than yours, I guarantee it. And uh, personally, I just thought it was a really fun game. I enjoyed the simple rock, paper, scissors style mechanics. Uh, it's a simple fighting game of grab beats shield, shield beats attack, attack beats grab. But it's very uh, accentuated in this game. It's very obvious, even to like a new player, that you have to know that and you have to kind of guess what your opponent's going to do and get in their head like that. And that's always really fun in fighting games. But usually that only happens at the highest level. So it's interesting that they kind of force it on new players in this case. It's got a pretty robust training mode with a lot of combo tutorials and stuff. That's cool. Uh, the biggest problem for me was not that many people actually got the game because it's kind of pricey for a fighting game. A lot of people don't like buying fighting games unless they're super into it, and not many people I know are super into it. And occasionally somebody would come over my house and I'd be like, let's play Pokken, and then they'd stop after 10 minutes because it's kind of overwhelming sometimes when you have 3D fighting and 2D fighting, switching, ran switching what seems like randomly if you don't know what's going on. It's pretty exciting when it does work and you get somebody who's on a similar skill level to you. It's very fun and tense. But the biggest problem for me was just not that many people around to play it with. Next up is Sombrero Spaghetti Western Mayhem, which is a game I think one of my friends saw on Steam and said, hey, if I bought this, do you want to play it together? I'll buy you a copy. And I was like, okay. So we played it together, and it's, it's okay. That's kind of my final analysis of it, honestly. It's a 2D uh, side-scrolling platformy type shooter kind of thing where you know it's kind of like towerfall if you've heard or played towerfall but the unfortunate thing about this game is it's not as fun as towerfall and in the same market as towerfall not only is it hard to be more fun than towerfall that game is amazing it's hard for me to want to play a game that's worse than towerfall it does have the advantage over towerfall that it has online play however the menu is weirdly confusing because it refuses to show keyboard inputs and Overall, the game is just kind of meh. Isn't really great, isn't really bad either. It's just kind of average. Next up is Ratchet & Clank, which is not the original game, but rather Ratchet & Clank 2K16, the reimagining of the original game based on the movie, based on the game, which totally should have been the title. I don't know why they did not call it Ratchet & Clank based on the movie, based on the game. It would have been perfect. It would have been such a good title. Like, who wouldn't buy that for their kid, really? But anyway, uh, I love Ratchet & Clank. It is my favorite video game, like, universe. It's It was my childhood, and I love it. It's great. It encompasses everything I like in a game, probably because it was, like, one of the first games I played. But I love jumping around in a 3D environment, and I like shooting people with really interesting and weird guns that stands by with me to this very day. And this game is a phenomenal return to form. The series had some kind of weird crap during the PS3 era, you see it had PS2, all the games were good, consistent. PS3 started out, and all the games were good and consistent, and then they had those weird multiplayer spin-off thingies, and then they went, had Into the Nexus, which was a fantastic game, and then they come out with this game, which is also just fantastic. Another great Ratchet and Clank game. It looks really nice, it actually does look stunning, the only sort of crappy thing is the frame rate isn't 60, but... Eh, some people it'll bother a lot, and I totally understand why. For me, it doesn't get to me that much. It looks a little bit less smooth. I would have liked it to be 60, of course, but what are you going to do? But it does look beautiful, and it plays beautifully as well. It has just enough new stuff to make you remember that like this is a new game, and it has enough old stuff for you to remember, hey, this is based on that other video game. It's a little bit short. It cuts like four or five planets, I believe, from the original. However, it is a good sort of short. It's a short and sweet type of experience that's really enjoyable. And, I mean, I just love Ratchet & Clank, man. It's, it's so much fun. I love it. Next up is Stardew Valley. It is a game where you farm. Also, it's amazingly fun, and I would recommend it. Farming may not sound to be the most exciting. However, there's other activities you can fish. And I know fishing may not sound to be the most exciting activity. You can uh, talk to people. Okay, these 
I might not be selling this game very well, but it's really, really good. It's heavily based and inspired by a game like Harvest Moon or Animal Crossing, those games where you walk around, you talk to cool, interesting people that don't actually exist. You give them gifts, they appreciate them. You farm, you craft stuff, you fish, you go mining. There's a little bit of monsters, sort of some very simple, very simple top-down Zelda-style combat in the game. And overall, the game is really good. It's just such a good game. It's a really calm, peaceful game that's just enjoyable to play. Except for the part where you're, the whole plot of the game is that your grandpa died. That's a little depressing. But he comes back as a ghost later, so it's okay. That might be a spoiler. Or I might be lying to you and just trying to make you feel better about the dead grandpa. You don't know. But what you do know, after this little spiel, is that Stardew Valley is very fun. And I would highly recommend it. And it also has gotten since it came out, an update, it's going to get more updates and developer support. Currently, I believe, all for free, and if there is ever paid DLC, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic. Stardew Valley is amazing, and I highly recommend it if you think you would enjoy managing a farm, talking to interesting people, and just living a life as a farmer in a remote town. Next up is Honeycam Studio, the uh, sort of successor to Honey Pop. Now, Honey Pop is a really good match through puzzle game. There's pornography in it. There is pornography in Honey Pop. And it's good. But more importantly, Honeycam Studio is the successor. Now, Honey Pop is actually a legitimately good match 3 puzzle game. Nobody will believe you until they actually play it. And they're like, hey, this is actually a pretty good match 3 puzzle game. But it actually is a well-designed game. And I'll stand by that till my death. So I bought Honeycam Studio thinking, man, this might be a well-designed sort of time management game. And it is. It isn't as good as Honey Pop was. Honey Pop was a really, really good, great, fantastic match three puzzle game. This game is just, it's good. Uh, there's also not really porn in it, which, you know, it's an interesting direction to take, uh, considering the last game uh, had porn in it. This game, uh, if anything, it's very soft core. Uh, I don't know why, I shouldn't be, why am I discussing this? My parents are going to watch this. Hi, Mom. Next up is Overwatch, and Overwatch... It's a really good first-person shooter. It's all player versus player. Well, there's that one time. But it's pretty much just player versus player. You play against other people. You shoot them with guns. It's really, really good. Really, really fun. It's got a fantastic art style. It's got a fantastic soundtrack. It's got phenomenal character designs and gameplay designs for those characters. Except for Hanzo and maybe Roadhog and kind of Widowmaker. Snipers are dumb. Except for Ana. She's the best. But if you don't know what Overwatch is, it's 6v6, competitive you know, against other people. There's 24 heroes now to pick from, and all the different heroes are awesome. They are really well designed from a gameplay perspective, from a visual perspective, from a auditory perspective, and from a story perspective. Overwatch is an amazingly detailed, well-designed game that is getting constant developer feedback and update for free, and overall, it's I couldn't recommend it enough. If you think you're at all interested in playing a first-person shooter, it's amazing. Next up is Wasted, which is a very cool game. It's a first-person shooter roguelike experience where it is a very Fallout-inspired world with a lot more uh, Fallout. I don't know. Like, Fallout's like, oh man, everything went to shit, and now we trade in bottle caps. And Wasted, it's everything went to shit, and now we trade with toilet paper. Uh, which is a lot more reasonable, honestly, because they literally just want to wipe their ass clean. So it's a very silly game. You know, there's a nuclear apocalypse, and now we trade in toilet paper, and everyone is obsessed with getting alcohol from these underground coolers where the rich people hid their alcohol. That's, like, the story of the game. It's a ridiculous game, but it's very fun. It's got a very appealing art style. It's got a nice soundtrack. The characters that you meet around the wasteland are fun. The dungeons that you crawl in are pretty fun. The only thing I personally found annoying was that it was very difficult to make meaningful progress and, you know, I just suck probably, but I ended up not playing past a few hours because I would go into the dungeon and I would die and then I would go in and die again and I never beat it. So, you know, because there are more than one dungeon. There's like a bunch of dungeons. So if I can't even beat the first one, it's pretty hopeless for my, my hero of the wastes to get past any of them. But it's still a very good game. If you enjoy a challenging FPS, roguelike style game, I would highly recommend it. Very, very fun. Next up is Enter the Gungeon, a top-down uh, sort of uh, Zelda style, sort of 2D Zelda styled roguelike. Uh, you don't have a sword though, you've guns. Because this game's theme is guns. Uh, sort of like Wasted, where you have a ridiculous theme 
of everyone and alcohol and all that weird stuff. Uh, Enter the Gungeon is a roguelike where everything is a gun. Well, not everything is a gun, but you, the enemies in the game are like bullet casings with eyes that walk around with a gun. Uh, there's tons of different interesting guns. There's a t-shirt cannon. That's pretty cute. All the bosses are various sort of mythological, maybe not myths. Well, I guess myths is an appropriate word. You know, you have the the gore gun. You know, it's like a gorgon, but it says gun. Get it? It's all stupid puns like that, and it's pretty cute. Everything is bullets and guns, and it's all themed in that way. And it's got a nice pixel artist style, and it's got very fun gameplay, fun gunplay. And it's just overall a fantastic roguelike, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Captain Forever Remix is another roguelike. However, it has a very interesting attribute that it's a top-down shooter, but you are in space. It's got a very cute aesthetic where everything is made in the imagination of two kids who are playing with toys. So you see them talking on the screen about how, you know, their spaceship is better than the other one, and it's cute. And the art style is very cute and everything in there. All the enemies in the game, their faces occasionally show up to blurb, and they're all little stuffed animals, sort of come to life, so to speak. It's a very cute aesthetic, very nice soundtrack to it as well. It's a very presentation-wise, freaking great, wonderful. And the gameplay is also really cool, because you start out with essentially a tiny ship with a bunch of parts on it. You maneuver the ship with your keyboard, and you deconstruct and reconstruct the ship with your mouse. So you can destroy an enemy ship, and then take its parts and slap it onto yours, so you can take a few extra thrusters to go faster. And where you put them matters a lot. You have to balance the weight of the ship, you have to make sure you don't have too much weight without enough thrusters. You have to put the guns, and then the guns shoot in the direction that they're on the ship. It's very interesting and very fun. It's also very uh, sort of confusing at first. It's very difficult to get the hang of, but it's so satisfying to just build a ship, design it well, and actually have it work in combat and control it well. It's... Everything feels like your fault, even more than normal, because the controls of your ship being crap. At first, you're like, man, my ship controls like shit. And then you're like, oh yeah, it's because I made it that way. And then you try to fix it, and you fix it. And it's like, wow, that was really satisfying. And it's just a really fun game, really fun aesthetic, really fun presentation, and really interesting gameplay. Would highly recommend it if you're interested. It's fun. Next up is Lumbermancer which is a game I saw on Steam, uh, threw it in the wishlist because why not? It looked kind of interesting. And after playing it for a little bit, honestly, it's really weird. It's even hard to describe. You're playing as a guy who summons pieces of wood that fight for him against monsters, and it's like a weird multitasking thing where you have to move the wizard, and you also have to move the plank of wood. Now, the wizard can't defend himself, but he can collect these little ghosts, and he can evade the monsters. The little ghost you can spend to upgrades or inventory stuff, you know, you can buy shit with it. And then the logs can fight. There's a sword log, a bow log, a torch log, because you have to keep the area lit so that you can stay there and don't get consumed by darkness. And there's a digger log. You use the digger to, he digs, and then logs come out of the ground, and then you pick up the logs, and that's how you summon more plank guys to fight for you. And you have to switch in between the four different types of logs, and you're controlling the dude with either one control stick on a controller or WASD, and then you're controlling the little plank with the arrow keys or the other control stick, whatever it is. So you're controlling both at the same time, micromanaging both of them. They can both get hit by the monsters, so you need to watch out for both of them. You need to protect the dude while he's collecting stuff. You need to kill the monsters with the other thing. It's a weird game, but I think I had fun? I don't know. It's weird. That's it, it, It's got a really cool art style that I like. And it's got a sort of chiptune kind of soundtrack to it. It's got a medieval sort of theme. And it's charming, but it's so weird to play. It's like hard for your brain to wrap around moving two characters at once, both doing different things in the screen. And it's just, it's weird, but it was fun. I, I, think, that's, I think that's good enough, right? It was a fun time, even if I was tripping over myself with a weird plank thing defending a wizard dude. I don't know, but it was interesting, I guess. Next up, we have Duelist, which is a really fun game that is easiest to easiest to understand is it's a collectible card game like Magic or Hearthstone mixed with chess. It is as simple, quote unquote, simple as that. Both of those games might be complicated to many people who don't know what's going on in them, but it's a really cool game where you have a game board, I believe it's five by nine, and you put your minions that are cards so you build a deck of cards, and then you have minions and spells, you put them onto the board and move them around on the board, which is a lot more interesting than a game like Magic or Hearthstone, where you put them down and 
then it, the where they are generally doesn't matter. But this game, they move around. There's space. There's 3D space. It's it's more interesting. It's very deep and strategic, and it's really cool. It's really fun to play, and overall, it's just a really cool game. It's got some wonderful pixel art in it with amazing animations for that pixel art. However, of course, if you don't like pixel art, then I guess whatever, you're kind of shit out of luck there. But it's really fun gameplay. There's a lot of cool cards, and overall, Duelist is just a really, really great collectible card game. Next up is Chronicle, uh, RuneScape Legends. Uh, personally, I choose to take that last part of the title and get rid of it because RuneScape is dumb. But Chronicle, on the other hand, is actually a pretty good game. It's a fun, collectible card game again, but unlike you know the sort of magic standard, I guess you can call it, of playing minions and then they attack each other or whatever. In this game, you fight your minions, which is completely different. Essentially, each turn, you play a few cards and you fight your minions and you're fighting your minions to prepare for the final battle against your opponent because your minions are going to drop things like weapons and gold and armor and then you fight the minions and you can use the gold to buy weapons and armor and you put all these cards in your deck and each turn you can play like four cards you play out your turn and you can also interact with your opponent who's also playing out their cards so you can play a card that says something like give your opponent's minion plus five attack and then they have to fight a bigger monster and if you predicted that they were going to play a certain type of monster or whatever you screw them over and sometimes they screw you over sometimes you counteract that by playing a card that they weren't expecting and etc etc it's very interesting it's very fun to play and it's overall just a really fun collectible card game with a very interesting core idea that i have not seen before in a collectible card game next up is owl boy a 2d platformer where you get to fly around as an owl boy it is a beautiful game first and foremost the pixel art in this game is sublime it is wonderful it looks beautiful and the soundtrack too is absolutely beautiful the gameplay is pretty good it isn't groundbreaking this game was in development i believe for nearly if not a decade and the gameplay kind of shows that it's kind of like a decade old it isn't bad but it sometimes feels a little bit torn, a little bit worn out. It isn't bad, but the presentation and also the story is quite good. The characters are wonderful, but the gameplay doesn't really hit the peak that the rest of the elements of the game hit. It falls a little bit flat comparatively, but even then, falling a little bit flat compared to some of the most beautiful pixel art I've ever seen and some of the most wonderful music I've ever heard and some of the most wonderful characters in a game, falling flat of that... I'm okay with the gameplay is still great even though it isn't as good as everything else it is still really good and if you enjoy 2d platformers owl boy is an absolute treat i would recommend it next up is on rusty trails which is another 2d platformer and one i enjoyed quite a bit it's got a charming little art style it's got a charming little story and it's got a nice little soundtrack behind it too it's a cute little game about a little red triangle man making his way in the world a world split between red triangle men and blue rain loving dudes it's it's a bit of a weird game but it's very fun it's very charming and overall i enjoyed my time with it quite a bit the main difference in this from other 2d platformers is that it's sort of a mario galaxy i guess kind of thing where except in 2d where you can go around the whole platform and jump off of it and stick to the walls and whatever and you know that works fine it's fun it's really fun to play and i enjoyed my time with it quite a bit i'd recommend it if you're a fan of 2d platformers next up is rot gut a 2D platformer styled in the theme of a sort of old Game Boy style sort of game based on like the prohibition in America, which is so weird, such a weird theme for a video game, but it was really fun. The game is like two or three dollars, I think. It lasted like 20 minutes. It was short and sweet, but it was enjoyable. It's a simple little 2D platformer where you shoot some guns at mafia dudes who are smuggling alcohol, I think. I don't know. I played it a while ago. But it's a fun game where you're a little mafia dude with a gun. You got a cool little hat on. You're in the Prohibition movement in the 20s for a reason, probably. I Again, it's kind of even weird that I, I never thought I would be saying... I never thought I would be talking about a video game set in the Prohibition movement, but I am. So, Rot Gut is that game, and it's a pretty good one at that. It's a fun game. I, I would recommend it if you're interested in playing a game set in the Prohibition movement. Next up, we have Kirby Planet Robobot, which, I mean, quite frankly, it's just a Kirby game. Is it good? Yeah, it's just a Kirby game. Uh, the main thing that's different is there's a big robot mech suit thing that Kirby can hop in, and uh, 
It's kind of cool because it's actually utilized in most of the levels and it actually holds over your copy ability. So it's a cool mechanic, but it's a pretty standard run-of-the-mill kind of Kirby game. It's fun, just like Kirby games are. Is it super different or new or exciting? Eh, not really. But if you like Kirby games, it's a Kirby game and it's fun. If you don't like Kirby games, then well, I don't know why you'd buy this because you clearly already have an opinion that conflicts with the purchase of such a video game. So just don't even buy it then, man. I don't know. I don't know why you would if you didn't like Kirby. Now, we've talked about quite a few video games today, quite a few, a good number. A respectable number of video games have been talked about, and now it's time to to debut the game of the year as by my opinion, which obviously means a lot and if you disagree with it you should definitely argue with me about it in the comments because it means a lot so my game of the year for the year 2016 ad was it was overwatch because i really like that game it's fun i enjoy it a lot i played it more than any other game uh, by far and that's saying a lot considering i played a lot of other video games too and overwatch continued to hold my interest for months upon months hours upon hours and overall uh i like overwatch a lot it's a really well-made game i i like it a lot it is really good just go play overwatch if you have any interest in shooting enemy gamers play overwatch it's fantastic thank you for watching my video about video games from the year 2016 ad i hope you enjoyed it and uh i'll catch you in another video maybe unless you hated it in which case i don't know why you sat through it this thing's been a long video so it's kind of weird that you sat through a video you weren't liking but you know all the power to you i i i, I believe in you i believe you can do whatever you set your heart out to you're a good person i don't know that you could be a serial killer shit i just told a serial killer he's a good person hi mom